Welcome to Sacroiliac and Pelvis Anatomy Review Part 2. I'm Jerry Hesh with the Hesh Institute in Henderson, Nevada, uh, PT Clinic and Educational Facility in Henderson, Nevada, which is very close to Las Vegas, 30 minutes away from the Las Vegas airport. This is a review for participants of the Hesh method of treating the lumbopelvic hip complex. But we thought we'll, we would release it to the public as well. This is an anterior view of the bony anatomy of the sacrum. Uh, this is the sacral promontory, uh, the top of the body of S1. Um, the lowest lumbar disc connects to that and connects the L5 vertebrae to that segment. These big projections are called the ala or wings. Um, up here a little bit cut off in that image is the uh, facet joint from the sacrum where the sacrum connects to the ilium. And uh, these are the foramina. And uh, here's the coccyx and the infralateral angles are important landmarks. The uh, sacrum is comprised of five segments, S1 through S5. Here's a posterior view again, and again there's the facet joints. And the element in yellow is the actual SIJ. Okay, it's a little bit difficult to see from a posterior angle, but the joint is comprised of the first sacral segment, S1, and then S2, and part of S3. However, there is considerable individuality. There are at least three major different types of sacral shape. A very good article in the October 2011 um, Journal of Spine that talked about the different types of sacrum. So down here of course is the coccyx. Note that there are four paired sacral foramina and the fifth sacral nerve comes out of the lowest margin here of the sacral, sacral cornua. This reminds us that people have different angulations of the articular surface of the sacrum. This does have clinical relevance. Most of our clients have the articular surface of the joint in which it tapers top to bottom very similarly to the tapering of the sacrum. If this person was being treated for downslip of the ilium, you would want to approximate that general angle and you would be able to tell clinically when ease of motion is allowed. And if it's not allowed in the typical direction, then the person might be this kind of a joint shape in which you have to test the angle of force that is applied. So some people have the opposite of the common one in which it tapers, you know, from the bottom to the top and then some people have a parallel uh, joint shape from one side to the other. So this one is normative tapering top to bottom and this one is the opposite. But the middle one is uh, the one you'll find most of the time when we get to clinical treatment uh, we will show you how you would screen for that very, very easily. It will become very, very intuitive. This is the pubic joint, comprised of hyaline cartilage on both sides, which is very uh, somewhat pitted, very um, uh, bumpy, designed for stability, obviously. The fibrocartilage that is in between them is only two to four millimeters wide. Some women who've had children will have one as wide as six millimeters, and of course, you know, the larger the person, of course, and the, the, the wider the uh, joint. During pregnancy, there's a central cavity that becomes fluid-filled, and that enhances the expansion of that joint, the separation of the, uh, of the pelvic bones. And uh, the correct width is measured right at the middle of the joint. Although in norms, it is only two millimeters wide. That's actually 
a generalization because if you look from top to bottom, it takes on this sort of a shape. And you can see in the middle where, where it would measure two millimeters, but at the extremes, it would measure much more than that. And please realize that as I've scribbled here, the rest of that is pubic bone here on the right. So to say that it's two, two millimeters wide in the center uh, doesn't give the whole picture. And that is also same for the ligaments. The ligaments that connect, such as the arch ligament below, which is very powerful. There's an anterior ligament six millimeters thick. That is remarkable. There's a dorsal ligament and a thinner posterior ligament. But those ligaments spread out very uh, elongated. So it really is a remarkably powerful joint. Very, very strong. I liken it more than a shock absorber. Uh, much more like a motor mount. Very, very small motions and it's designed for compression. Um, during childbirth the function changes and in, during childbirth birth, this ligament actually lengthens where you get separation of the lower part of the joint but you get upper joint compression. That will be discussed later on. This is a posterior view of the anatomy which once you uh, remove the gluteus maximus muscle, it is just remarkably complex. And it's a great reminder of the complexity there. And um, here we have the piriformis muscle lying at about a 30 degree angle. Cluneal nerves up here, sciatic nerve down here. Um, here's the posterior hip capsule and a tremendous number of hip rotator muscles that expand very, very long. I do have an article that discusses treating all of those hip rotators, not just focusing on the piriformis, which is actually a very, very minor hip rotator. It gets a lot of press because it does uh, sometimes uh, go into spasm and because the sciatic nerve can go underneath it or through it, um, can have some compression there. Um, clinicians like to focus on it, my recommendation is actually to treat all of the hip rotators. The ones that get forgotten sometimes is this short one, the uh, quadratus femoris. Very stout, very horizontal. Same with the horizontal fibers of the adductor magnus, which actually have a, uh, a different innervation than the rest of the adductor musculature. It's important to look at the structure in the sagittal plane, lateral view. And so this is a view of the right hemipelvis now. You can see the boomerang shape pointing anteriorly and inferiorly. Here's the uh, pubic bone. Here's the ischial bone. Ischial tuberosity is down here. Ischial spine is here. PSIS is here. Iliac shelf up here. And the ASIS. So this is the right side of the sacrum, which would, f of course, flip over and then articulate with the ilium there. And the iliac cartilage is fibrocartilage, which is relatively thin, whereas the sacrum is dense, smooth, more smooth, hyaline cartilage. Um, however, the joint shape actually has a lot of bumps, interdigitations on a macro level, also on a micro level, which greatly enhances the uh, frictional properties and clearly that joint was designed for stability. The function of that joint has much more to do with stability than mobility. Um, paradoxically, you need a little bit of mobility to increase the stability in the joint when you go from laying down to standing up. Um, the sacrum nutates forward, bends a little bit, pulls on the ligaments, pulls the ilia close, and then uh, they squeeze the joint a little bit more. So you actually have a little bit of mobility that enhances the stability. This is a repeat of the uh, views that we've seen previously, but it's a good time to point. All of this space here cannot be touched. This is a very, very craggy, very bumpy, bumpy uh, area, full of ligament, chock full of the short and long sacroiliac ligaments, and especially the very powerful interosseous ligament. And if someone were to sustain enough trauma that bone actually would not, I'm sorry, that ligament would actually not tear. The bone would break 
prior to that ligament tearing. So this is 10 minutes. Uh, I will just uh, go over by a very, very short amount. And uh, this repeats the fact that the joint is comprised of the first sacral segment and then the sac second sacral segment is at S2. Now if you were to find the PSIS on the ilium, it would be lateral to S2. So the PSIS is an important landmark and then only part of S3 comprises the lower part of the joint. And so here we remind that there are all kinds of uh, bumps and crevices and there's a central elevation in the center of the sacrum and on the ilium there is a bump called Bonier's tubercle and there's a very uh, stout ligament back here, a very stout uh, ligament called Illy's ligament. Very nice study done by a physical therapist uh, on the properties of that ligament which has less elastin than the other SI ligaments. When we talk about birthing, I'll talk about how that uh, may act as a stop for transverse plane motions. Nice lateral view of the ligaments and the uh, greater and lesser sciatic notches. And you can realize that although uh, true things like upslip or downslip where the ilium is actually moving on the sacrum as opposed to just hip hiking caused by muscular function, um, a true downslip can alter the dimensions of this opening and the roof of the sciatic notch is actually quite sharp. I had a human specimen absolutely sharp. It was remarkable. And um, we do have some dramatic YouTube videos of treating a child who had a downslip injury. And uh, we were able to help him with one, one treatment after he had uh, been to multiple, multiple clinicians, um, hospitalizations, etc., etc. And that video is uh, under the Hesh Institute YouTube and it is called Downslip that looked like upslip. Uh, but I'm not sure if that's the exact term, but both terms upslip and downslip are in the title. There's also a view from, uh, in the fourth video we interview his father and uh, his mother does a separate uh, video. So I'm going to stop here. I've probably taken you to 12 minutes and I apologize and uh, hopefully we can wrap this up in one more uh, shorter video. Thank you.